to 19. We looked at 1 Peter last Sunday night in the overview that we're doing every Sunday night of a, of a, of a different book of the Bible. The theme of 1 Peter suffering for Christ. And I want to focus in today on chapter 4, verses 12 to 19 as we think about suffering and the persecuted church. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me and follow along as I read 1 Peter 4, 12 to 19. I hope you have your Bibles and find it in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put it on the screen so that you can see the text as well as hear it. Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let, no, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord press these things to us today that we might remember our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, some 215 million Christians who are suffering for being identified and willingly identifying themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. I told you this story before, but it seems so apropos of what we're looking at today. Getting to meet Samuel Lam in Guangzhou, China, who had pastored, shared the gospel, been imprisoned in China off and on for decades. And as he was standing there talking with us after the meeting that night, he described how every time he went into prison, though they destroyed his sermon notes, destroyed his, his cassette tapes, destroyed the benches where they sat in, that, in the place where they gathered, destroyed everything they could, that when he came out of prison, that church had grown. This happened over and over. And he said to us that night, persecution is good for the church. I promise you folks, that is not a mentality embraced in the West. And yet it is everywhere else in the world. Because they understand that the scripture teaches that if you're going to be identified as a Christian, you'll suffer persecution. I want to move real quickly through some verses to wrap up these thinking today before we move to our fellowship meal in a little while. I want you to see in this passage five things very quickly as we think about right attitudes toward suffering as a Christian first we should look at persecution as normal we should look at persecution secondly as fellowshipping in Christ's sufferings and as an occasion for rejoicing third we should look at persecution as blessedness fourth we should look at persecution as something for which to praise God Finally, we should look at persecution as something in which God can keep or preserve our souls. Have you ever thought about that or not? Persecution is one of the ways God uses to preserve us and strengthen and enable us to persevere. First, look at persecution as normal. He says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. In fact, that's a, it's an imperative verb there. It's a command. He commands them, don't be astonished. Think about that. And when you read the stories, and if you've been tracking with us, we go through this on Wednesday night on prayer meetings for 50, 50 Wednesdays out of the year. We bring it to you in a, in a little snapshot form on Sunday mornings. The stories of people who suffer for Christ around the world, and the joy that is always attached, many times through tears, 
but the joy that is attached to it. It's normal for them. What is not normal for them is when they find out that in the West we don't tend to suffer so much. They don't understand that when they experience what they do and they read the scriptures like they do. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16 to 25, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you're to speak or what you're to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. That takes faith to believe that. For it's not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death. The father is child. Children will rise against parents, have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see the connection? Suffering, persecution, and endurance. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? And then again in John 15, 18 to 21, If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. And Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Suffering is a gift as surely as grace is a gift. <coughs> Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Then 1 John 3.13. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. It's normal. Persecution is normal. Now, it's not normal here. It, it, you, some of you have experienced a measure of persecution. I know I've, we've talked to you about that. But it's going to get worse. It's going to intensify. That's what happens when the Lord purifies his church. You're going to see that in a moment. Second, we should look at persecution as fellowshipping in Christ's sufferings and an occasion for rejoicing. Look at verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The two go together, the sufferings, the glory. John 15, 21, all these things they will do on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. And then Romans 8, 17, and if children, in other words, we're children of God, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided, provided, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See the connection? Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. We already read to you Philippians 1.29. Look at Philippians 3.10. That I may know him. Paul says, here's my magnificent obsession. It should be ours too. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Do you long for resurrection power in your life? To live in the power of the gospel? Conquering sin? overcoming remaining sin that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death Colossians 1 24 now I rejoice Paul says in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body that is the church not suggesting there that Christ was coming up short but, but observing that when he bore up under suffering for Christ, people could physically, visibly, tangibly see that in him and be drawn to give glory to the Christ who suffered. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. 
And we looked at 2 Timothy 3.12 already. I'm, for the sake of time, trying to move through these. Our text in 1 Peter 4.14, If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The apostles went forth in Acts rejoicing that they were so identified with Christ that the religious leaders wanted to beat them. Samuel Lamb also said to me, to our group that night, I said, do you have a word for the church in America? Never been to America. He said, the church in America needs to cultivate the mindset of suffering. He said, you may not suffer, but you need to have a mindset of suffering. To see, experience that you're blessed when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for the sake of Jesus and for the gospel. That's a blessing. That's not a misfortune. It's not a foul up. It's not a cosmic quirk. It's a blessing. Then verse 16, if in, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. A mindset of suffering. And then the third thing. We should look at persecution that is, reproaches for Christ's name as blessedness. Blessedness. Verse 14 says that. I just read to you verse 14. The word blessed, by the way, that's the word in the Beatitudes. I know you may not have ever thought about persecution being a Beatitude. Blessed are you, but Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. And the word means, it's, it's the Greek word makarios, it means to be spiritually happy, spiritually prosperous. It's interesting. These Christians we see in videos and read about in stories have everything taken from them because of being identified with Christ. But in their place comes the spiritual prosperity, a spiritual happiness that cannot be understood any other way than identified with Christ. Fourth, we should look at persecution, that is suffering as a Christian, as something for which to praise God. What do you praise God for? You praise God when... When things go your way, do you praise God? When a, when a material blessing comes, all those are appropriate. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But do you praise God when persecution comes? Do you praise God when your family reviles you? Do you praise God when your family turns their back on you because of your identification with Christ and the teachings of Christ? It says, let none of you suffer as a murderer. There's a whole discussion there. There's, some people suffer because of their foolishness. And then they want to identify, you know, the, be the fellow who runs the red light and gets pulled over and says, well, I'm just being persecuted because I'm a Christian. No, you're paying the price of running a red light. Those three things don't go together. Okay? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Paul says this throughout his letters. Don't be ashamed of me a prisoner of the Lord, which would have been easy, don't you think? Your, your friend Paul, you told us about Paul, I heard he got arrested again. Don't be ashamed, but glorify God. For it's time, and this is, this, it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Why does judgment begin at the household of God? Because a disobedient church needs purifying. And a couple of things have happened historically when judgment comes to the house of God. Some flee. Some decide, I don't want to be identified with that. I wasn't signing on for this. You've heard the stories told about World War II and the, and, and the Korean War that's happened as well. So I'm told, I believe the sources, that Christians would be gathering in some of these countries in, in a clandestine way. Enemy soldiers would break in and say, all right, I want all the Christians on the wall over there, line up. And Christians would take their stand on the wall. Others would just slip out. they say, if you're not a Christian, you can leave. And people who had identified as being a part of that church would then slip away so as not to be harmed. And when they were all gone, these soldiers had been known to say, we're Christians too. We just wanted to meet with the real Christians here. Judgment begins at the household of God. It'll have a purifying effect. It'll burn away the dross. John 15 tells us 
Nobody escapes pruning. Christians are pruned that they might grow. Jesus says, you're the vine, you're, you're the branches, I'm the vine, my father is the pruner. Every branch is trimmed. And branches that don't bear fruit are cut down and thrown into the fire. Every, everyone gets trimmed and pruned. Difficulty. To purify the believer. To expose and prepare for burning the unbeliever. There is the purifying flame for the church. There is the, the penal flame for the unbelieving world. He goes on to say, if it begins with us, if judgment begins in the house of God, and it does begin in the house of God, and it's coming to the house of God, and it'll come to this house of God, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it begins in the church, then those who've been identified with the church but are not obeying the gospel of God will be treated just like those outside the church who persecute the church, who hate the church, who despise the church. See, the issue is not... How closely attached are you to the church? The issue is, does your life obey the gospel of God? If it doesn't, then it's set aside for eternal burning. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? That's, don't have time to develop this, but this is shorthand, ungodly and sinner. For the first table of the Ten Commandments, ungodly, one's relationship to God, and the sinner, one's relationship to one another. What will, what will happen to one who does not obey the gospel of God. And finally, we should look at persecution as something in which God can keep and preserve our souls. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. So there's the parameters. What is suffering according to God's will? It is suffering as a Christian. It is, it is suffering because you've been identified with Jesus Christ. And the world hates that. And brothers and sisters, if you haven't noticed, that is increasingly happening here. And I'm not, I'm not up here for a political speech, but I'm going to tell you something. If one particular party in this country gets their way, then everyone identifying as Jesus Christ is in the crosshairs. And liberties will be taken away. It's not the end of us. There are Christians all around the world, 215 million of them today, who are, who are persecuted and purified, and the church is growing. I'm just simply telling you That if we suffer according to God's will, not because of our own foolishness, lawlessness, but according to God's will, then we will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God my Father. Trust your souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And that's, that's the journey we have. We don't need to go around bemoaning and, and sad sack because we're not suffering like our brothers and sisters in Pakistan are suffering or brothers and sisters in North Korea and many other places. We go around living, doing good. It is said of Jesus that he went about doing good. We live a life calculated to glorify God, set forth Jesus Christ to a lost generation, to become increasingly conformed to the image of Christ until the Lord takes us home either by death or by the return of the Lord to take his, his people home. And we entrust ourselves just as Jesus did in Peter. First Peter says he entrusted himself in the midst of his suffering. We entrust ourselves to a faithful creator. He is faithful. He's the one who made us. He knows what we can endure. He knows that death for us in the name of Christ, for the cause of Christ, ushers us to a wonderful place called heaven. This is the right attitude towards suffering as a Christian. I talk with some of you. I know how people respond to some of you. And I say, hang in there. Rejoice. Thank God that family, friends are reviling you, accusing you, pushing you off, saying, don't judge me. They're, they're saying that because they feel judged <laughs> by the light. Darkness always does feel judged by the light. And live for Christ. And remember those who are experiencing intense persecution, even if you're not. Remember those as if you were right there with them in chains. Pray for the persecuted church. 
We're going to start this cycle over again very soon. We'll go through the next 50 that are lined up. We started on Wednesday nights. We bring it in here. Pray for the persecuted church. We've done this several years now. I hope that, that there's a mindset being developed in you that you know some of these places. We watch on Wednesday nights whether the church we're, the country we're praying for, whether it's moved up or down. Down is a good sign. It's moving down in the numbers. Up means the persecution is more intense. Pray for the persecuted church. Before we close, I want to ask you, does the world find a great comfort with you because you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ? Confess your sins today. Repent to him and trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. Does the world find a great comfort with you because you've somehow decided to hide your light under a bushel? Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do it. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, even if that means they persecute you before they learn to glorify the Father in heaven.